second episode of Nuked Radio with Ratchet, and my co-host today is Jules. We're going to be talking about signs and symptoms of radiation exposure, and there's a couple people that I want to say hi to right off the bat and direct you to their page. If you're on Facebook, please check out Radiation Watch, Zio, Ray, Deb, Nick, and Samuel. There's really good info on there, great attitudes. You can learn a lot from those people. They specialize in Geiger counters and radiation readings and any questions that you have about either those are the people that you want to see also um, Stephen Moyer at Radiation Health Solutions on Facebook um, also a great page to check out and of course Fukushima Facts everybody everyone everything that we talk about on the show is verifiable and a lot of the information you can get from the links that we have on there uh, we're going to start off though with a clip from Chris Busby, he's somebody I consider a high-cred person. He is an expert on the health effects of ionizing radiation. And there's two things that I want you to pay specific attention to in this, uh, in this recording. And one is what happened to a gentleman named Bandashevsky, who was a Russian researcher when he published data about how radiation affects the hearts of children and also the physiology of the heart that is explained by Chris Busby. It's about a five-minute clip. Chris Busby, I'm a, a, an expert on the health effects of ionizing radiation, and I want to talk to you about um, Fukushima and Chernobyl. Um, what I want to say is that, about, uh, is, is to, is that uh, the, the models that are used to determine the effects of radiation always concentrate on cancer and leukemia. And so the current risk model will say how many cancers are expected after Fukushima and how many cancers were expected after Chernobyl and so forth. But we know from Chernobyl that radiation causes a whole range of diseases and, and one of the diseases that it seems to cause is heart disease. I want to talk to you about heart disease effects in children. Now, a colleague of mine, Professor Yuri Bandashevsky, uh, became quite famous um, because he studied the effects of cesium-137 exposure to children in the areas that were contaminated by, um, by the Chernobyl accident in Belarus. Uh, he discovered uh, in the late 90s, he discovered um, that the children who were contaminated to the extent of having a, only 20 to 30 becquerels per kilogram, which is not very much, of cesium-137, were suffering cardiac arrhythmias, that, that that's, uh, the, the heart wasn't, wasn't beating properly, um, and they were suffering heart attacks and dying. And it's a very serious matter. So it wasn't a question of leukemia and cancer in these children, although that occurred as well, but there were very high rates of heart disease in these children. So the children were manifesting um, heart diseases which are normally only found in old people. And this got me thinking about how this could be at, at what appears to be quite a low level of contamination. So I started looking into this, and what I found is truly extraordinary, which I shall share it with you. The, the, the heart of a child is, is um, at the age of about two, or, uh, uh, two to five is, quite, is, is, is about this size, and at, at the age of about ten it's about this size. And we know from measurements that have been made how many cells there are in the heart of a child. The, a five-year-old child has a, has a heart which is approximately 220 grams in weight. Uh, a lot of it, of course, is, is blood. So if you take the blood out and just you leave the muscle tissue, there's about 85 grams of muscle tissue in, in the heart of a child aged five. This is all data. Now, we actually know also the size of, of, of the, heart, um, the heart muscle cells. So we know how many heart muscle cells there are. In, in a child's heart. There are, about, there are about 3 billion muscle cells in a child's heart. So this is a number, 3 billion. And what we can do is we can put 50 becquerels per kilogram of cesium in a thought experiment. We can put it into this heart muscle. And a becquerel uh, is one disintegration per second. So we can see how many disintegrations, uh, that's how many electron tracks uh, come from, from this cesium-137 in a period of about a year. And when we do this, Simon, mean, it's really simple. It can be done on the back of an envelope. What we find is that there are many, many more electron tracks tra traversing the cells than you can imagine. And in fact, it works out that if only 1% of those cells 
were, da- were, were killed by the electron traps from that level of cesium-137. If only 1% were killed, you would lose 25% of all the muscle cells in the heart. And this is very serious because the heart is an extraordinary organ. The muscle cells in the heart are autonomous. They just contract and they contract and they contract for the whole period of the life of the individual. And every day they pump 7,000 litres of blood through the body. Truly extraordinary. And we live for 70 years. So this heart beats away continuously for the whole of your lifespan. But of course these cells are non-replaceable by and large. It turns out that, that, that only 1% of these cells can be replaced in a year. So if these cells get damaged, or if a particular number of these cells get damaged, they cannot be replaced in a short period of time. So, so a year's exposure to 50 becquerels per kilogram of cesium-137, and incidentally, uh, cesium-137, we know from experiments, binds to muscle. So this is where it goes, just like iodine goes into the thyroid gland and strontium goes into the bone and it goes to the DNA. So, uh, cesium-137 goes to muscle, so it will concentrate in the muscle tissue of the heart. Had you heard about Bandashevsky before, the researcher? I had not. Oh, you know, what this guy went through, when he published his data, he and his wife were both physicians, and they did post-mortem exams on, on kids that died around Chernobyl, and that's how they made this hard connection. You know, they called him a terrorist. The Russian government labeled him a terrorist and jailed him for seven years wow. for his research. And it was only because a human rights group got involved that he was released. And then they still made him stay under house arrest for a few more years. Um, I'd really like to know what, what he's doing now. But, you know, this is the kind of, uh, this, is, this is what researchers face when they go up against anything that has to do with the nuke industry. They get discredited. And the same thing was happening to, to Chris Busby a little while ago. There were people coming out saying he was trying to make money off this. You know, and it, it's just, uh, it's insane that you have to deal with these kinds of distractions. But what I wanted people to really come away with from that clip and, and from the show today is that, you know, everybody worries about cancer as a health effect of radiation, but that's actually something that comes down the road. Except for thyroid cancer, that can happen um, quite rapidly. But there's many other early signs that you may be getting low levels of exposure. And your body has an amazing ability to heal itself, and it can actually fix a lot of the damage that's caused by radiation exposure if you're eating properly, if you're getting enough sleep, if you're protecting your immune system, and if you're taking care of yourself. And one of my biggest fears... And all the stuff that I've been reading over the past year is cesium because cesium destroys kids' hearts and it doesn't take very much to do it. And it's actually something that's very easy to check for. As he was explaining, they can have an ECG done. That's a a non-invasive test. It's not that expensive. You know, they they put a few pads on the kid's chest and they just monitor the, the sinus rhythms and they can tell if there's damage to the heart muscle. And if you live in any of these heavily contaminated areas and your kids are showing any of the signs or symptoms that we're going to go over today, it may be something you want to talk to your pediatrician about. Because the other thing that I've been learning is that doctors, as part of their medical school training, they don't learn about the the effects of radiation exposure on health. It's just not something that's covered in med school, which astounded me. Unless you're going into oncology and radiation oncology, they're not trained for this. They were trained for it back in the 60s when we were in the Cold War and when there was the the threat of being nuked by Russia. In case that ever happened, you know, as a a kid in school, we were all taught to, to go under our desks if something happened. But when we come back, we're going to get right into the signs and symptoms. Welcome back to Nuked Radio with Radchick and Jewel. One thing I want to mention real quick, you're going to hear this a lot. I'm going to try to explain what a Becquerel is. Don't ask me how to spell it. You'll see it abbreviated BCQ. And what it is, is the number of disintegrations per second in a square meter. And the number that you want to focus on is 50 because that's the limit that's been set 
that's considered um, okay for human health. Although I want to point out quickly, and we'll get into this more when we do the Chernobyl episode, is that the government has set the limits around Chernobyl at 37 becquerels as being the limit um, that can be in food and, and baby formula and milk and things like that. Japan set it at 50, and I think some of some of them might have even set it at 100, 50 to 100 for babies. Um, babies are 100 times more susceptible to the effects of radiation than an adult, and a lot of these numbers are, are set for a 70-pound person. So um, there's whole new tables that need to be created for people who get repeated exposure. And two quick reports from the U.S. Department of Interior, U.S. Geological Services, Portland, Oregon, had the highest iodine-131 deposition in the entire United States at 5,100 becquerels per square meter, meter, and that was by April the 5th. And keep in mind that the releases have been ongoing. The USGS also reported in the L.A. area that they had the highest cesium deposition in the entire U.S., right after Fukushima, at 286 becquerels per square meter. 23 samples were taken across the country. All came out positive. Some of the other states that were tested were Alaska, other areas of California, Colorado, Illinois, Minnesota, Missouri, New York, South Dakota, Tennessee, Vermont, Washington, Wyoming, and Michigan. So let's get right into the list, and if you have any family members that have ever gone through cancer treatment, then a lot of these things are going to be familiar to you. Number one is hair loss. You'd notice that your hairbrushes are full of hair, shower drains are full of hair, you might have hair on your pillow or your shirt, and also pets losing a lot of hair. And I've had multiple emails from people in the Pacific Northwest about their pets being sick, especially the ones that spend a lot of time outside and losing their hair, not uniformly like they would because of warm weather, but they're losing it in clumps. And Jules and I both have had sick pet issues in the past year. Jules, you lost your cat last summer, right? I did. And don't forget Darren, too, his dog. Um, I'm with my cat, actually, he... Uh, he was a pretty old cat, but uh, he insisted on having to go outside. He he would not use the litter box. He had to go outside. And um, I tried to keep him in for a few weeks after Fukushima first happened, and uh, he absolutely would not have any of it. So in the end, I had to let him out. And within, I would say, probably three, four days, um, he couldn't walk anymore. Uh, he... His nose started to peel off like it was the most horrifying thing I've ever seen. It got really dry. It all peeled off. And he then he couldn't breathe, and he died very shortly thereafter. I mean, like I said, he was a sick cat to begin with, but he was still functional. Mm-hmm. And uh, within just a few days of going out, he, he was gone. Well, I had the same thing happened to my Sheltie, but, you know, he was really old, too. Um, he was 10, and he liked to go outside and eat snow, and the kids let him out on the balcony one day after the only snowstorm that we had here all winter, and he ate a bunch of snow and came in and started throwing up, and um, the next day he couldn't walk, and two days later we had to have him put down. But, you know, he he was ill to begin with, and he was old, but radiation affects people more severely who are elderly and who have already health problems because their uh, immune systems are compromised. Exactly. The, the number two sign would be nosebleeds. If it's something that doesn't usually happen for you, and of course nosebleeds are common for a lot of people with allergies and, and things like that, but if it's, especially if it's happening in multiple family members at the same time. And I can relate to this because there was one week in July, and I was just thinking today, you know, the, Fukushima had a big blowout in June. There's a bunch of videos of that on YouTube. And in July, I got a nosebleed, and like the same day one of my kids mentioned that she had one in, in front of one of my other daughters. I have four daughters. And, and one of the other kids said, I had a nosebleed too. We all had them like within two or three days of each other, which was very strange. 
But, you know, other than that, we felt okay. You know, anytime you see anything like this, it's kind of a sign maybe you need to step up your mitigation if you don't have a Geiger counter to really assess, like, what's going on in the air around you. I mean, it's not practical to have your Geiger counter with you and on all the time. It drives you crazy because it's always, you know, beeping. <laughs> So I just, you know, I kind of just pretend that it's there all the time and, and, and go a lot by how we feel and what symptoms we might be having. And luckily we haven't, you know, had anything too severe. Um, number three would be weird, unexplained bruises. And I want to share an email that I got from a woman in southern Ohio about two weeks ago. She went to the dermatologist, mentioned she had a large bruise on her hip. She doesn't remember getting it from anything. And the dermatologist told her that he has seen many patients recently for the exact same thing. Uh, this was Southern Ohio. I believe she said she was either in Dayton or Cincinnati. But again, you know, doctors aren't trained to really spot this stuff unless they're paying attention to, to Fukushima, which doesn't seem a lot of them are. Number four, bleeding gums. After you brush your teeth in areas of severe contamination, even losing teeth. And there was a woman in Fukushima who actually blogged about this, and the government's response was that it was probably hormonal. You know what, though? Haven't we, I mean, we heard a lot of reports from um, people that uh, some of the other hosts were getting emails from, too, in California. Um, quite a number of reports of people with bleeding gums over the last uh, eight or ten months. Yeah, and they were all using tap water still to brush their teeth. Yeah, we we actually well, I keep a um, bottled water bottle and cap next to each sink. So when we Me brush too. our teeth, we remember to rinse with that water. And one of my kids mentioned the other day, get the baking soda toothpaste, which I never even thought of, but that's that's a good idea. Uh, number five, lingering illnesses or exasperation of of breathing problems. Um. RAVs don't only affect your immune system, but they can also cause viruses and bacteria to mutate. And a really good example of this, or at least what I think, and this is my theory, is there was a cantaloupe outbreak of a, a very unusual strain of listeria uh, back in the, um, I want to say it was like August. And it was in numerous southwest states. And it killed a few dozen people, but it was something that had never been found in cantaloupe before. And viruses mutate constantly anyway, but radiation will um, exacerbate that. And since it does also affect your immune system and the ability of your body to heal itself, you know, it makes sense that if you get something like bronchitis... You know, that it might stick around a lot longer than what you're used to experiencing. So, again, these are just, you know, signs that you may need to step up your game a little bit as far as mitigation. With Rad Chicken Jules, Jules was just reminding me on break of a couple of other weird strains of things that she had read about recently. Yeah, um, a few of the things that I uh, saw over the last few weeks is. Um, They've had this mass death of seals on the New England coastline since the first of the year. And uh, they did some studies, uh, took some samples, and discovered that it was uh, influenza A that these seals have. And they said that they've never really seen this before. Um, it's killing them all. Uh, but what's even more interesting is that then a few weeks later, they came out with uh, the fact that they're now finding it in bats. And it's killing bats. So... Um, it's something that they have never seen before, uh, influenza A in bats, um, in seals. Uh, someone in chat had actually brought up this um, virulent strain of strep throat that's been going around. And yes, my family has had a bout with that. I uh, spoke to my pediatrician and apparently it's a strep throat that is being spread by a cough. And my pediatrician said that they've never seen that before. I mean, typically it's going to be, you know... Um, air droplets and whatever, but it was coupled with a cold, and uh, all the kids in school had it. And then didn't you say, um, oh, two, we were talking about on the break, the uh, those white stringy 
Um, they don't even know what they are. Some sort of life form that they've been finding now on um, spent fuel rods at uh, one of the nuclear power plants here in the U.S. And mm-hmm. they think it's some sort of mutated something. So I think we're in trouble um, just in regards to what the radiation can do with uh, mutating different bacteria and viruses. Yeah, and I heard recently that MRSA can now be spread just by sneezing which is really scary. Um, you know, I was, I was always raised to shake hands with people <laughs> when you meet them as being uh, polite and having manners, but I think maybe the days of uh, shaking hands are over. So we'll get on with list number six, extreme fatigue. Can't get out of bed. Uh, I have an email to share from DM. I live three hours north of Sacramento in Redding, California. My husband and I are both quite fatigued most of the time, but otherwise fully functional. I have all my life been a get-up-and-go person, and now it is extremely hard to get out of bed. The worst in my book was the yellow powder everywhere after it rains. I was walking my dogs and knew these were particles. Google searches showed the same thing happened in Chernobyl and Japan. The Russians and Japanese were all told that this was pollen. So again, we're you know having these reports. I, I have to say the majority of emails that I get are from the Pacific Northwest or in the Midwest. Uh, number seven, and this is an interesting one that you probably wouldn't have uh, associated with radiation exposure, mental problems and aggression. And there was a story on any news, um, and this was back, this was published January 2nd. Animals went mad and began attacking humans after exposure to high radiation levels, says Chernobyl scientists, dogs, foxes, wolves, and hogs. There's actually a video that you can watch about this. And at 5.40 into the video, they say the dose of radiation exposure was so high that lots of the animals who were exposed just went mad. The dogs that were left in the zone went to the forest. Foxes, wolves started attacking people who were working in the zone. In fact, even the hogs in the wild became so mad they started attacking cars. We were going from Chernobyl to where we stayed overnight to Pripyat. One hog attacked our car with such force that we almost went into the ditch. Now, I've got a family friend who lives out in Utah who's a big skier, and he seems to be having some of these aggression-typed problems. Um, Thyroid dysfunction can sometimes be mistaken for bipolar disorder, and radiation does affect the thyroid. And, Jules, there was actually a story that came out a few days ago that was really strange where a stewardess... um, had had caused a disruption. It was actually before the flight took off, thank goodness. She ended up scaring a lot of the passengers because she told them at the beginning that they weren't going to fly. The plane was going to was having some kind of malfunction. And someone came over the speaker and said, actually, that's not true. Um, we're going to take off as, as planned. And she just went crazy. And she attacked two other stewardesses, and they had to take her to the hospital. And I found out later that she is bipolar and she wasn't taking her meds. But, you know, the people that fly in planes are getting exposed to gamma radiation already from being at high altitudes. Uh, it's breast cancer is a much higher incidence in, in people who work in the airline industry. And you got to wonder how it's affecting, it's going to affect these people health, people's health if they've been flying through fallout for the past year. And yesterday on the show we were talking about how they had considered actually grounding planes because of the fallout situation at the start of Fukushima, and they decided against it. So, I mean, this was something that was uh, was on their minds, too, that uh, this could be a problem. And, and uh, there is a guy on YouTube. His name is Enviro Reporter, Michael Collins. And over Christmas time, he flew from Santa Monica to Michigan and recorded extremely high levels of radiation uh, while they were up in the air, in fact, Medcom that makes the inspector Geiger counter says that you should get about 200 CPMs at 28,000 feet. And they were actually getting, I think he said, 60 times over background. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty significant. They wore masks on the plane. And when they got to their destination, they took off the masks, established a background 
uh, of radiation and then uh, did a reading on the masks, and the masks were hot. So they had caught particles in those masks. Wow. And it's something to think about. If you fly a lot, I mean, it's not practical to just tell your employer, yeah, I can't fly anymore for business. But at least think about wearing a mask on the plane. You may be the only one doing it. But, you know, people will see you and then maybe question to themselves or, or to you directly, why are you wearing a mask? You know, what are you worried about? Use a Sharpie and write Fukushima across the front of that, right? <laughs> that was Darren's idea. I think it'll yep. work. <laughs> yep. Um, one of my observations, and was, this is just a, a personal observation that a few people on Radiation Watch ha have noticed also, is that when our Geigers read high, your eyes start burning. And I, I worked in ophthalmology for a long time. I don't have any allergies. I don't wear contacts. It's not normal for my eyes to burn. But, I mean, even without a Geiger counter, even, you know, without that, I can almost feel when they're getting high because I've correlated that symptom with high readings. And it, it's, it's very noticeable. And when I have the burning eyes, everybody around me is complaining of it, too. That and, like, a really extreme pressure headache almost like your head is in a vice, and then all of a sudden it just goes away. So um, another one, a big one, rain and snow causing skin rashes or even burns. Now, back in July, one of my dogs ran away, and, and this was when I was just learning about fallout. I had, I had to go chase him because I knew the neighbors were going to freak out like they usually do. Um, and someone called animal control, and so it was me and two other guys running around trying to catch him in a just uh, a terrible downpour for almost an hour until we got him. And when I got home, I noticed I had raised welts on both of my arms. And I thought, did I run through the bushes? No. I, how did I get these? It looked like scratches all over. And so I, I took a, a shower with baking soda and I took some Benadryl and it went away and I felt fine afterward. And I, I you know, again, it was in July. This was around the same time we had the, the nosebleeds going on around here. Uh, about a month after this, one of my kids got stuck in the rain and she got the flu almost immediately. And she was in bed for three days. And on the third day, she woke up and she had a burn on her wrist and she had been laying in bed and. I had put out a video on YouTube. It ended up going viral, and and I got a lot of, you know, crap for it from people saying, you know, don't try to scare people. You know, it looks like um, it looks like poison ivy. It looks like um, ringworm. You know, all, these people were all saying there's no way that came from radiation. Well, I took her to a dermatologist. She went to her pediatrician first. Um, he sent us to a Japanese dermatologist who actually did a biopsy. He took it very seriously, and the biopsy came back that she had a burn. They couldn't attribute it to any kind of chemical. They did not have a facility for testing it for rats, so as to this day, we don't know how she ended up with a, a burn on her arm from laying in bed for three days. But um, things that you need to watch and, and I've seen some reports about this on, on any news and some other forums too of people experiencing the same thing we and yes, I have an email that I want to share from you about the skin rashes from PS wow I'm in Columbus Ohio and I have the same rash this is in response to the video I put out about my daughter this hurts and burns like nothing I've ever had, and I'm 50, also HIV positive. Sorry to say, but you've nailed it. I also have heavy chest congestion, thick mucus like I've never had before, and I was just ready to say I'm gone. I live alone with my two dogs and post my life on Facebook. Please contact me there if you like. And I have been in touch with this guy uh, quite a bit since then. Number 10, nausea and vomiting, but... <sighs> That is really just in cases of extreme exposure. That was something that was um, was noticed among the um, Chernobyl liquidators. They would get hit with this, like, really severe vomiting, and then they would go through kind of a period of latency where they, for a couple of days they would be okay, and then they would get really sick again after that. But that's nothing that you would probably notice unless you, um, unless you were right next to uh, a nuke plant. 
Number 11, bleeding from the colon, bloody diarrhea, even persistent diarrhea could be a sign. And I have an email from SG. I am writing this to you because I live in a small town 50 miles south of Portland, Silverton. Since the Japan accident, myself and daughters have had significant medical issues, scaly red blotches on scalp, nose, and mouth. Docs just give me cortisone. I have constant diarrhea for the last five months. And then she goes on to talk about heavy periods and things like that that the girls in the family have noticed too. Uh, number 12, and this went kind of along with what we were talking about before, sick pets. You know, animals are smaller. They're lower to the ground. If they go outside, they may be drinking rainwater. Uh, one thing, and when we were told, you know, that you, you wouldn't have, that radiation is invisible. You can't see it, taste it, smell it. But all those things have kind of been <laughs> disproven. In San Diego, there were um, there was a jet fuel smell that was uh, recorded a few months ago that turned out to be chlorine 58, I believe, and it was, again, a, a component of nuclear fuel being mixed with seawater from the rods blowing into the ocean and from the reactors being cooled with seawater. And people in San Diego were actually smelling that. And the metallic taste is something that um, has been widely reported by uh, soldiers and military personnel when they were uh, allowed to watch atomic bomb detonations. And uh, it was also widely reported in the U.S. after Fukushima. So it's one of, one of the signs that you may be um, in, in a plume or, or being hit with fallout is a metallic taste in your mouth. And when you have that, there's nothing you can do to get rid of it. You can't drink or eat anything. It's there. It's very persistent. And you and I both experienced that in March yep. last year. Yep. There was a research study that was published that you can search out on Google. At first, they had, they had come out with uh, 14,000 excess deaths in the U.S. since Fukushima. That's been revised up to 20,000. And to explain what the term excess death means, um, the CDC records mortality data from around the United States. And you can go back and you can look at the graphs for the last 10 years, and you can see that there's been kind of a steady decline and then after Fukushima, everything took a jump. And the way they determine what part of the population um, is exposed or killed by radiation is by excess deaths. And after Chernobyl, there were 40,000 excess deaths in the United States. And I wasn't aware of that until the 25-year anniversary, and I saw that published somewhere. You can search it out and read up more on this article if you want. But uh, for the first 14 weeks after Fukushima, there were 20,000 excess deaths in the U.S. And I think the numbers changed because they didn't have data from all of the regions. Um, and I have a, one other email that I want to share with you guys. This is from Cynthia, who is a commander in the Greek Air Force. I just saw your vid concerning your child, and I was very disturbed. I believe what you are going through is a major ordeal. I can understand your frustration about your child and Earth in total. I want you to know I'm a Chernobyl survivor myself. Forgive my English. Eighteen years ago, I was out in the toxic rain of Chernobyl. Three years later, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. I had surgery, took it out, and I am still here, alive and kicking. Made a sweet family, and I keep on going healthy as a horse. What we are going through, the whole globe, is unbelievable. Fukushima radiation is all over the earth right now, as Michio Kaku said. Please keep us informed. All the love of the universe be with you and your loved ones. So there's hope. And... What we're going to talk about tomorrow is everything that you could possibly do to mitigate this in your daily life. And if you have anyone in your family who's elderly, who's maybe already sick from, from cancer or a severe illness, if they have immune suppression problems, if they're a child, if they're a baby, if you're pregnant, you need to take these things more seriously than maybe my family even needs to. Um, all my girls are older. Um, they're through their, their period of growing 
um, they're 17 to 26. So they're probably in the age group that's least affected. And even if the radiation turned out to be some giant hoax, which it wouldn't be, the changes that you would make in your life to mitigate it are basically just living healthier. It's a no-lose situation, and it's going to be months and years before we actually know, and really we won't know the true level of contamination until a soil survey has been done of the entire United States and Canada and Europe, and they can determine what radionuclides blew out of those reactors as opposed to radionuclides that came from other, some other source. And the problem is, for those of us who are downwind of Japan, it's one thing if you live right next to a reactor that blows up or one that's leaking all the time and your family's sick. If you went to the doctor and you said, what do I do about this? Well, they give you blood transfusions if you're showing illness. Um, they would tell you to mitigate they would tell you to eat healthier, they would tell you to filter your water, and they would tell you to move. I mean, obviously, if you lived in Chernobyl or Fukushima, you would want to move. But what do you do when you live in the jet stream that's coming from these reactors and you really don't have an option to move? If it's all over the globe, then we're kind of stuck where we are and we've got to make the most of it and what we can do about it is to let other people know that this is going on so they can protect themselves and their families and to just take the best care that we can of our own families. You have to become a, an advocate for your own health. So tomorrow what we want to get into is um, the mitigation. And I also have a guy that uh, is going to be coming on between tomorrow and Friday, so we might have to move things around a little bit. His name is Jim Walsh, and you may remember him from CNN at the start of the Fukushima disaster. He had a very, very compelling interview with Elliot Spitzer, and I'm going to post that on Fukushima Facts today so you can watch the video in its entirety. And he was giving out all kinds of really interesting information about some of the fuel that was in the reactors in Japan. And it was actually reprocessed um, fuel that came from Russia. And we're going to have him maybe explain a little bit about th the MOX fuel and why it's so dangerous. Part of the reason is because it contains plutonium. But what Arnie Gunderson has said is actually all the reactors contained plutonium. And the reason for that is because in normal operations, reactors produce about 500 pounds of plutonium a year. And those reactors in Fukushima had all been running for about 10 years. So there was plutonium in all of them. And plutonium is the good stuff. Plutonium is actually the most toxic element on Earth. Yeah. Um, it's named after, I think, the devil. <laughs> um, it's 10,000 times more toxic than anthrax. And plutonium has actually been found in soil samples as far away as Boston in the United States, plutonium from Fukushima, and Lithuania just published a research study that they found plutonium in their soil samples. So it crossed over us before it got to Lithuania. And there's something else called these buckyballs, which is a, uh, a radioactive um, particle. It's actually like a group of particles together, a uranium cage that contains plutonium inside. We don't really know what these things are doing because they're not it's something that any lab has ever visualized before. So we'll talk about that, hopefully with Jim Walsh tomorrow. If not, we'll talk about mitigation. And thanks for being with us today. You're listening to New Trado with Radchick and Jules. We'll be back tomorrow, same time. See you then.